Hello, my name is Lindsay Zorovchek. Um, I'm an engineer on the NoSQL infrastructure team at Bloomberg. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with Bloomberg, uh, it's a technology company that provides financial data through software known as the Bloomberg Terminal. Uh, the terminal has more than 350,000 subscribers, uh, offering different financial analytics tools that we call functions uh, to finance professionals around the globe who use our data and news uh, every day to do their jobs. We have over 21,000 employees in over 70 countries, uh, 9,000 of whom are software engineers. Uh, many of our engineers are active members of the open source community, both as engineers and, uh, sorry, both as users and contributors. Uh, some who serve as PMC members or hold governance roles. Uh, and Bloomberg, over the last two decades, has really transitioned into becoming an open first company, and we use uh, hundreds of open source projects in our products and our infrastructure. A little bit about my team. Um, we offer Cassandra as a service to engineers at Bloomberg, and our goal is to make it easy for engineers to um, use Cassandra to power their applications without needing to understand the complexities of managing a large-scale distributed database. Uh, the same can be said for the other infrastructure uh, teams in our larger data services org that we are part of. We started in 2017 and have been growing ever since. So the scale at which we now operate is uh, around three petabytes of data served by 3,500 uh, Cassandra nodes broken into about 275 clusters. And operating at the scale has presented a number of interesting challenges. Uh, and we've learned a lot about the many obscure ways that Cassandra can fail. Um, so in this talk, I'll go through the issues first by presenting uh, the warning signs that helped alert us that something was wrong, the steps that we took to find the root cause of the issue, uh, and what we did in the short and long term to remediate these issues. So without further ado, I'll go through the first problem. Uh, we were initially alerted by high disk usage alarms for several machines, and we realized that they were all hosting the same cluster. Uh, this wasn't impacting our users yet, but it was impacting us as operators, uh, since these disks kept filling up. Um, so we looked at a few other metrics for this cluster to start to diagnose the issue. Um, one particular table had a large number of data files that we saw in the SS table count graph. Uh, we also noticed that the droppable tombstone ratio that defines the ratio of data which can be cleaned up by Cassandra to live data uh, was very high, over 100%. Um, there were really two questions that we needed to answer. One, what was deleting the data and thus generating these tombstones? And two, why was compaction not merging these data files together? So looking at the table schema, uh, we saw that the TTL is what's generating the tombstones. The table is compacting data using time-windowed compaction strategy. Um, on the surface here, nothing seems too strange. Um, so why wasn't compaction cleaning up this data? Using the SS table expired blockers tool um, and the SS table metadata tool, uh, we see the data consists mostly of expired data. And actually, the max expiry time is different from the minimum expiry time. So this is preventing the data file from being dropped, which is in turn blocking other data files from getting cleaned up. But why are there rows that are expiring at different times? Uh, looking at some application code here, we see there are some code paths which are using, which are using the using TTL clause um, in their insert statements. Some rows are using a TTL of two minutes, where others are relying on the table default TTL um, and expiring actually after six months. So to explain why this is a problem, we'll look at how time window compaction strategy works. So quick overview. In Cassandra, all data files are immutable, and these immutable data files are called SS tables, a word which I will use a lot. Um, compaction is the process by which Cassandra merges SS tables together. In this process, the deleted data, which is known as tombstones, uh, will be purged and cells will be merged together. Time window compaction strategy has an objective to create one data file per time window, and data in a given time window will generally be queried together in a time series use case. Uh, so having one single data file that you can consult uh, and one in which the data expires around the same time is a nice optimization to have for that use case. Um, so once uh, the single SS table is created for a given time window, time window compaction strategy is not going to merge it with any other time windows. So to actually purge the tombstones from these SS tables, 
Time Window Compaction Strategy prefers to drop fully expired SS tables as long as it's safe to do so. Otherwise, it will rely on tombstone compactions. So now we can go into our example. First, we'll start out with no data on disk. Uh, for the sake of this example, we'll say that our time window is one minute. And we'll write some data and we'll generate our first SS table, SS table A. So the numbers that you see uh, on the items on this SS table will represent partition keys, 0, 1, 2. Uh, and we'll write some more data and generate another SS table, SS table B. So each of these SS tables has data which fully expire in two minutes, designated by the little key here on the bottom in green, uh, ideal for a time window compaction strategy. So compaction will run, merge these into a new SS table, SS table C. Data is nicely organized, expiring all at the same time. We'll continue writing new data. Cassandra will flush some data to disk, resulting in the creation of SS table D and E. So these tables are not nearly as nice. Uh, you can see that some data expires in two minutes and some actually expires in six months, so the yellow. Running compaction again, we'll merge these into a new SS table called SS table F. So now two minutes has passed. Uh, SS table C has fully expired. It would be great if we could clean up this data, but uh, remember there's a single SS table for one given time window. So Cassandra will no longer run regular compactions on SS table C to merge it with other SS tables. Instead, it's gonna rely on purging fully expired SS tables like we talked about. Um, and tombstone compactions. So why is this SS table not being purged? So Cassandra will check to see if there's any partitions which overlap with live data um, for which these tombstones might be masking data. So in this case you can see among other partitions, partition 0 and 1, uh, overlap between SS table C and SS table F. Even worse, partition 1 is going to stick around for six months uh, since that's yellow. Uh, so this is our first issue. In this case, Cassandra is only going to purge SS table C when there are no overlaps, meaning that we'll have a lot of tombstones that will pile up on disk, especially over six months. Um, so continuing on, we'll have two new SS tables uh, that get compacted into SS table I. So more time has passed, and now the some of the data from SS table F has also expired. Um, but the SS table isn't completely expired, so it's not eligible for being purged, but a tombstone compaction could help here. Um, so why isn't this tombstone compaction cleaning this data up? Well, similar to checking if we can purge an SS table entirely, compaction is going to run a check to see if it's even worth attempting to run a tombstone compaction. And part of this check is whether or not this SS table overlaps with uh, live data in other SS tables. Um, so we can see here, in this case, SS table F has a number of overlaps, uh, one and three, uh, but does have some tombstones which aren't overlapping with live data, uh, like partition zero here, so that really should be getting cleaned up. So how do we do that? Uh, the first option is to set unchecked tombstone compaction. Uh, this will let Cassandra run a tombstone compaction even if SS table uh, data has overlaps with other live SS tables. And so in this case, only the tombstones which do not overlap will be purged, so that partition zero from the example, um, and that'll help clean up some of that. If that's not enough, um, we can also set allow unsafe aggressive S SS table expiration. Uh, this name sounds scary, it's supposed to. Um, it can only be set if you know for sure that your data is 100% append only TTL data. Uh, if it's not, this can end up purging tombstones that you actually need and cause data resurrection. Um, so to set this, you have to uh, set a JVM option as well as adding that um, to, to your compaction strategy. And this would have allowed us to purge SS table C, the fully expired. Uh, SS table from our example. Thinking a bit longer term here, another solution is to change the data model to work better with time window compaction strategy by bucketing different expiry times into their own tables. Uh, this can help prevent the issue in the first place if you know upfront that you need different TTLs. Um, sometimes this is not feasible. Sometimes you really do need fully dynamic row level TTL to solve your problem. Um, so in which case we recommend moving away from time window compaction strategy using leveled compaction strategy. Um, since this is going to create com more compaction activity, allow us to more aggressively uh, compact SS tables. Um, we've actually re been recommending our users to use leveled compaction strategy by default, um, even patched our internal deployment of Cassandra to use uh, this as default. Um, 
But one feature we are excited for in Cassandra 5.0 is a unified compaction strategy, which Brandon is talking about later today. So um, that'll be exciting. Okay, so now on to our next issue. So we're seeing right time, don't switch. Um, seeing right timeouts occurring on a few nodes in one data center. Uh, we're not 100% sure what the cause is, but the writes seem to be always timing out in the same data center, indicating uh, three responses were received. So this is a good hint that cross data center handoff is failing here. Looking at the logs in the remote data center to where we saw these timeouts, we also see one node has um, an out of memory error. But that's strange, why is it still running and getting new requests? So if you use the default JVM options with ship with Cassandra, uh, the exit on out of memory error flag will be set that will cause Cassandra to exit when an out of memory occurs. Um, but this is actually only for uh, heap space or metaspace exhaustion. So for a native out of a native thread out of M, which is what we see here, the JVM is going to still be up and running. Um, so why are the other nodes still sending it queries? This has to do with gossip. Um, so as long as the gossip threads are still running the pings which are sent to the dead node are still going to be acknowledged. So the other nodes in this cluster still think it's up. Um, that way, uh, the way that Cassandra performs synchronous cross data center writes is by choosing one node in the remote data center, which will receive a mutation message and forward it on to other replicas in the data center, uh, who are supposed to acknowledge back to the query coordinator. However, if this node cannot create new threads, these mutation messages are going to start to queue up on the node and never actually get processed. So the other Cassandra nodes in the remote data center are not going to know that this write was supposed to occur and are not going to reply back to the coordinator, um, which causes a timeout from the coordinator perspective. Even worse, since the coordinators don't realize that there's a dead node here, it can be chosen again on a client retry, uh, resulting in yet another timeout. So first and foremost, you need to identify that the native thread out of memory has occurred. Uh, and when this happens, you should ensure that the node is killed. Uh, JVM agents like JVM Quake are great at helping to automate this process, uh, and that will mitigate the immediate problem and prevent synchronous cross data center writes from failing. Once that issue has been solved, you can debug further why the Cassandra JVM cannot actually create new threads. Most often, we've seen this due to a misconfiguration of NPROC on the machine, uh, or running Cassandra through system D without setting the task's max parameter. And one thing to note is that while we originally found this issue in Cassandra, this is an issue which plagues all JVM-based software, uh, so we highly recommend applying the same lessons we learned here. Okay, next issue. All of a sudden, an application is seeing sporadic authorization errors, but we haven't made any updates to the authorization policy for this cluster. On the server side, we see that we're under a lot of load, and we see this specific error message about a failure to authorize a user. Looking at how Cassandra um, actually handles authentication and authorization, um, Cassandra maintains internal caches of authorization policies, roles, and credentials on each node. And so on a cache hit, the request is authorized. However, if a, if a cache entry has reached its expiry or if the policy is not present in the cache, then Cassandra is going to perform an internal query to the system auth roles and roles permissions tables in order to refresh the cache. So. Why is the failure actually happening? These authorization queries get added to the queue with other queries, and therefore when a node is already overloaded, uh, these queries can also start to time out. So if this auth request fails, there's not really an exception that can be thrown other than um, unauthorized exception or authentication exception, depending on which part of the pipeline actually fails. So when this error gets sent back to the client, it gets sent back as an authorization failure instead of being categorized as a query timeout, which applications will typically retry. So what can we do about this one? Um, these type of exceptions will indicate uh, when it's a result of a failure to authenticate, including when these system auth table queries time out. So we can know uh, that these errors should actually be retried. So we recommend adding these retries and error handling to your application if you haven't already. Uh, if you're curious why these error types are thrown, I've included the uh, Cassandra Jerry here to understand it more thoroughly. Um, additionally, increasing the validity of the caches um, with uh, config such as roles validity, permissions validity, and credentials validity in milliseconds are going to result in fewer cache refreshes, uh, helping to reduce these failures as well. Also in more of a long term, if you're not on Cassandra 4.1, upgrading to Cassandra 4.1, uh, and then also allowing for asynchronous cache, uh, cache refresh. 
So looking at kind of these last two solutions, um, when we set async refresh, these additional system auth queries aren't going to happen at query time, um, and so that, that will help a little bit. Um, while the validity and the refresh configs both default to two seconds, a strategy could be to set the async refresh period to a value that's less than the cache validity so that you'll always hit the cache if the policy exists. Um, it's also worth noting that while the async refresh will help to avoid this type of error, it doesn't necessarily reduce load on your cluster. Uh, in times of high load, you still may ex experience the load shedding that causes this problem, and these queries can still time out, but the difference is that the error doesn't get, get sent back to the client and really cause that confusion. Additionally, you may now be reading from the system auth tables a little bit more frequently, so uh, depending on your refresh rate, uh, this might also add to increased load. Okay, moving on to our final issue and some new content, for those of you who have maybe seen this talk before. Um, so this started with a client reaching out to us. Um, they had created a copy of their cluster to use for benchmarking, and using Spark had migrated their data over to a copy cluster. They noticed that their data size was only about 50% of the uh, original size, um, and they were worried that they had experienced some data loss during their migration. Um, so in order to investigate, we asked a few questions about their application. I wanted to know what their use case was. Nothing seemed too obvious up front, so we wanted to take a deeper look. So we started by um, looking into some data files in the original cluster using the tool uh, SS Table Metadata. We noticed that there was an overlap in the first token uh, that was shared across uh, multiple SS tables here. Uh, so we also used the uh, node tool get SS tables um, to verify that this was uh, on multiple SS tables here. Using SS table dump to actually search these SS tables for the specific partition key that was overlapping, um, we were able to look at the actual data. And so seeing this data across several SS tables, the problem became a little bit more clear. There were some rows that had incomplete columns and some that were fully populated, indicating to us that these columns were being populated during different insert statements. And so to actually simplify what was happening, some data gets inserted, flushed to disk, and then data with another column gets inserted and flushed to disk, and so on, until this one partition key is now present in several SS tables, taking up space on disk. So when they went to migrate their data to their new cluster, these keys that were being written and updated several times were present across several SS tables in the original cluster, were now only being written once to the copy cluster, and therefore the row was only present in one SS table. And effectively, this migration compacted together SS tables, but why wasn't that happening on the original cluster? Uh, well, as we found out, they were effectively doing multiple inserts, even though they didn't really realize the impact that it was having. So the first thing that we needed to do was to uh, find the right compaction strategy for this cluster. So it was originally using size-tiered compaction, which was not the most ideal uh, for this use case. So we updated to, you guessed it, leveled compaction strategy. Um, hoping that this would actually reduce the repeated rows and the overall data size to explain the difference. And once we did this, we did see the difference drop, but there was still some unexplained difference here. Uh, additionally, what we noticed was that both clusters were on the same and ideal compaction strategy, uh, was that the original cluster had a higher compression ratio. So revisiting our SS table dump from before, uh, what we looked at was from the original cluster, which is now on the top. So. Um, the cells we saw earlier from the original cluster after switching to LCS and on top, uh, and we see on the bottom here is the copy cluster. And what we notice is that because of the multiple inserts changing data in columns at different times, there are now column level timestamps on the original table. And on the copy cluster, since the entire row was written at once, um, there's only a row level timestamp here. And so if we take the, the size of the timestamp and multiply it by the number of rows and the number of columns, in this case, it was at over 150. Um, then we found the culprit. I think more interesting, though, than the explaining the data size difference to our clients was kind of some of the lessons that we learned here along the way, um, which are three main things. Uh, one, enabling query tracing would have helped us to diagnose earlier that the application was doing multiple inserts and realize that as a potential uh, cause for data size difference. Uh, the takeaway here being that clients don't always know how their applications are interacting with Cassandra or the impact that their decisions really have on their cluster, so verifying what the query is doing is worth checking. Um, second, doing multiple inserts for the same row means that columns that were present before the next insert 
are now going to have the cell timestamp of the previous row level timestamp. This can very quickly take up space depending on how many rows and columns your use case has. So if possible, limiting the number of multiple inserts that you do um, or trying to insert more columns as the last insert rather than the first since the columns that actually match the row timestamp are not going to have a cell timestamp. And if your inserts are close enough together, it may be possible to actually increase the mem table size to have these flushed to disk at the same time um, and present in a single SS table, preventing some of that extra data that we saw earlier. Um, but if you really do have to use multiple inserts using leveled compaction strategy. Um, and lastly, piggybacking off of that, uh, we saw how changing the compaction strategy affected the data size and even the latency for this use case um, in compacting this together. So there was only one SS table, their read latency decreased. Um, so it was significant uh, for them to mistake the, the data size difference for data loss in the beginning. 50% um, is a big, big number. So um, figuring out what the optimal compaction strategy actually is for your use case can help uh, with that and also in the long run save you money, either as an application team, you know, allotting quota or as a platform team budgeting for disk. So. Despite all these issues, we survived. Our platform lived to fight another day. Um, and I've gone over the solutions of the individual problems that we face, but there are some larger lessons to be learned kind of across all issues. And the first is observability is immensely helpful in identifying issues in Cassandra. Um, there are a lot of metrics available as well as very thorough logging. Uh, so make sure to use these in understanding what's going wrong. Uh, a few tools that I mentioned, node tool, SS table metadata, SS table expired blockers. Um, those all help in diagnosing cluster issues. Um, second, configuration is very important. I know it's really tempting to use the default configs, but there are a lot of opportunities to enhance performance and prevent the type of issues that, we've set, uh, that I've gone over today, so if you're willing to dig a bit deeper. Um, which, in addition, the uh, official documentation, the ASF JIRA, also has um, very helpful information on what some of these configs are. And finally, I cannot stress this one enough, be proactive when monitoring your systems. Uh, learn the early warning signs, such as an increasing droppable tombstone ratio, uh, and act when you see them to prevent the fall of your application. Okay. I'll take questions. <laughs>